Welcome everybody to today's virtual digital economy seminar. It's a great pleasure to continue the series with another very interesting paper. Our moderator for today will be Hannes Ulrich, who is in Berlin and also in Copenhagen, and he will introduce our speaker momentarily. If you have any clarifying questions throughout the talk, please send, the, send these to Hannes in the chat window. He will unmute you so you can ask your question in person. If you prefer, you can also ask Hannes to ask the question for you. We will collect questions for the Q&A after the talk in the same way, so don't hesitate to send these questions to, to Hannes. As always, the session is recorded and made available on YouTube, so if you do ask a question yourself, you will appear in the recording. All right, happy to hand over to Hannes. Thank you, Christian. So I'm very happy there to see all of you again, and uh, even more happy to have uh, Bo Kaugel today as our guest. He is an assistant professor at Columbia Business School. And uh, I don't know, so every time I go to his website to, uh, to look for a paper of his, I'm always impressed by, by the super cool topics on AI uh, bias, AI fairness. Uh, I think he's got a lot of interesting work. And uh, so today he'll present one of these uh, papers and I'm very much looking forward to this. Um, so Bo, you have um, 45 minutes and then we'll have a Q&A. Bo is yours. Great, uh, thank you so much, Jonathan and, and Christian. Um, I'm presenting joint work today uh, about a field experiment in operationalizing AI ethics. That's joint work uh, with Fabrizio Dell'Acqua, who is a PhD student. Um, he's not on the market this year, but but will be before too long. I think he's uh, actually uh, on the call today. And also with um, uh, Samuel, Daniel, Nicole, and Augustine, who are my colleagues uh, in the computer science department um, at Columbia. All right. so. Uh, you know, the, the topic of this paper is something that you've probably heard a lot about uh, in the media and in research seminars increasingly, uh, you know, in economics, but also in, in neighboring fields. Uh, and that is this, this idea of, of algorithmic bias or machine learning algorithms uh, incorporating or perpetuating biases, you know, fr from historical data sets. Here's a famous article about this happening in criminal justice. It also has uh, purportedly happened uh, in hiring algorithms used by, uh, um, by Amazon. Uh, so this hasn't been quite studied quite as much. Um, and then also there are some people that think that the use of AI can actually uh, help with diversity. And here's uh, a, you know, uh, an article about this in the context of uh, selecting startups. <clears throat> as media attention has increased on this topic, of course, uh, researchers have followed. Um, and there are a, a host of different uh, conferences that now publish uh, research about this, but it's mostly computer, uh, you know, computer science theory research. Okay. So in this paper, uh, what we think is, is missing and what we try to contribute, um, you know, is an empirical paper about the AI development process and how these are linked to bias outcomes. Uh, so, you know, most code written in production is not done by um, uh, CS theorists, it's done by uh, everyday programmers who uh, may not understand CS theory uh, and who may be subject to organizational forces like incentives or culture or things that don't typically appear uh, in, in CS theory uh, models. Okay? So specifically, we think uh, you know, the, this literature could use uh, clean, random, uh, experimental variation in, in programming practices uh, in settings where you have uh, metrics of success or failure in algorithmic bias. And then we can try to causally link programming practices with, uh, with the presence or absence uh, of bias, okay? And this would help us understand more about the uh, empirical or organizational aspects of, uh, of algorithmic bias um, and you know, get at the question of why, uh, why do these biases arise in the first place or, or what, you know, what can we do in practice? Uh, to reduce them. Okay. Now, with that uh, motivation, um, here's how we tackle this problem uh, empirically in, uh, you know, in our research. We have um, 8.2 uh, million algorithmic predictions of math skill uh, by uh, about 400 AI engineers in this paper. And the 400 AI engineers have been randomly assigned uh, to different experimental conditions. Uh, and their treatments or experimental interventions change their incentives, uh, their training data, uh, and in some cases, their awareness or their technical knowledge about AI ethics and possibly how to, um, you know, how to reduce bias or unfairness. Okay? Um, and so using this experiment in the development 
uh, of, of machine learning algorithms, we can examine these hypotheses. Uh, first, we have the, the biased programmers hypothesis. Uh, this is the idea that assigning a more diverse or possibly less biased group of programmers to, to build algorithms will, will reduce, you know, reduce bias in the algorithms that are produced. Um, and we also examine, you know, broadly speaking, the bias data hypothesis, which is that, uh, you know, improving data uh, will, will reduce bias. Um, and it may seem somewhat obvious that improving data quality will, will reduce bias, uh, but we include this for two reasons. First of all, it's useful as a benchmark for our other interventions. Um, and second, as we'll see, some of the mechanisms through which bias data end up, or sorry, unbiased data end up being helpful, um, I think are, are not obvious and not anticipated uh, by prior literature. Okay? And then finally, we look at a, a series of interventions that are practical and policy oriented that, that any manager could possibly use in their own, um, in their own organization, uh, you know, to try to reduce the bias in the outcomes produced by, by engineers. Okay? Just to tell you some more about these hypotheses, um, <clears throat> You know, here's a quote that summarizes the biased uh, programmer's hypothesis. Uh, this is related to, you know, research on the intersection of productivity and diversity. And the, the bias that people are talking about in, in biased programmers doesn't have to be deliberate bias, okay? Now, if you think that biased programmers are the problem, then the, um, the solutions are to try to improve representation uh, in the AI workforce, um, or maybe to try to de-bias engineers uh, through awareness or through, through some, some sort of training. Um, so our paper tries to get at these, uh, first of all, by having a relatively diverse uh, group of subjects. Uh, our AI engineers are about 30% women. Uh, that's about 10% more than on average in the US. Uh, we also administer an, an implicit association test to try to, to test their, their biases. Uh, and then finally, <clears throat> Uh, we try to debias engineers on the fly uh, by having a reminder intervention uh, that basically says, uh, please think carefully about the bias you may introduce by using, um, you know, data or methods that, uh, you know, that have been optimized for historical data uh, only. And then, of course, we have the, the bias data hypothesis as well, which, which presents uh, algorithmic bias as more of a technical um, or engineering problem. Um, there are several versions of this critique, but the, uh, the biggest one, uh, you know, places convenience data as the main sort of bogeyman. Um, if you think this is the problem or the main problem uh, behind algorithmic bias that we see in the wild, um, then the policy solutions, I think, are, are very different from what we saw on the last slide. We should try to improve the data pipeline. Uh, maybe we should try to uh, improve technical methods um, or, or develop new ways of dealing with uh, convenience data to try to, you know, scrape the bias out of them, essentially. Okay? So we actually <clears throat> uh, examine a, uh, uh, some, some interventions uh, that, that, that address this hypothesis by providing training and also by uh, exogenously changing uh, what training data sets each engineer in our experiment was given. Okay. Oh, well, so this gives you a, an idea of the scope. Uh, yes, Hans. Um, there's a first question. Um, okay. Uh, by uh, Brandon Cun Cunningham. Um, so I'll mute, it, I'll mute him. Here you go, Brandon. Okay, how's it going, Brandon? Hi, hi, Bo, how are you? Um, Great, how about you? Good, thank you, good. Um, there's a couple of papers in the economics literature which seem to suggest that uh, when subjects are made of uh, self-aware of their own biases, uh, there's this paper on uh, NBA referees um, mm -hmm. uh, ma making play calls uh, that are on, you know, uh, differential according to whether the person shares their their racial identification. And right. um, yeah. yeah, so do you actually give the subjects their IAT results? Uh, we don't. I think that's a you know potentially good idea, um, but they're not given the the, the results. Um, now we do have an intervention that tries to make people aware of their biases, which is this reminder. <clears throat> but it's given to everyone in that treatment condition and not differentially to some people uh, and not others. The implicit association test, um, which is a controversial test, but we thought it was the best test to measure what what we're what we were after, which is some sort of latent. 
or um, you know unconscious bias. Um, you know this was administered after um, after the results were um, were turned in, and I can talk more about why uh, when I get to that section. <clears throat> um, let me know if there are any other questions. Uh, but so far, you can see the broad uh, outline of the experiment. Um, and uh, let me tell you how we, we examine outcomes now. <clears throat> so we have uh, out of sample predictions uh, on that is ground truth math performance for about 20,000 subjects uh, who were not in the training data set. Uh, and then randomized manipulations in some cases of the inputs. And you can think of these randomized uh, manipulations as being sort of like, um, you know, uh, like an audit study of an algorithm uh, where uh, you know, other researchers have, have randomized the names on resumes. Uh, well, we have randomized the uh, gender and the other labels um, you know, in the training data or, or in the evaluation data uh, to try to see what's the effect of those perturbances in the way uh, that you know, the algorithm scores candidates. <clears throat> Um, and you know our, our goal here is, of course, to attribute biased uh, code uh, back to you know behavioral and personnel issues, um, and, and also to worker characteristics. Um, and um, you know we have a very rich data set of programmer characteristics, including education, demographics, um, and attitudes about various topics, um, uh, and etc. Okay, um, so this is how we we evaluate this. Um, and uh, I'll get into more of the design uh, and results uh, and, and other details next. But just to preview, uh, our paper is going to be focusing uh, mainly on accuracy uh, as the outcome metric uh, of this experiment. Okay? And here's why we're doing that. So even if there were a decision maker that has uh, uh, you know, objectives other than just, say, hiring the person with the best math score, uh, maybe they care about, uh, they have an explicit preference for diversity, or maybe they care about other skills uh, other than just math, then having unbiased predictions uh, of, of, of ability will help that decision maker be on the efficient frontier uh, between uh, performance on math um, and the other objectives that they, uh, you know, that they may want. And, and in addition, uh, typically engineers uh, you know, working in companies don't formulate the other criteria or how a, a business is doing hiring will, will weigh diversity with uh, math, with uh, other non-mathematical abilities and et cetera. Um, and, um, you know, that's typically done by uh, other business leaders. Um, uh, and as a result, you know, uh, our focus is mainly on what, what engineers typically do for uh, given our sample, uh, which is to try to make uh, predictions. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, now let me give you some preview of the results, uh, and then I'll go into the details of the experiments. Okay. So our first main result uh, is about the benchmark, and uh, in some aspects of it, you know, will probably not surprise you. Uh, unbiasing training data had the biggest effect on, uh, on performance and bias, um, but about a third of this effect uh, came from a novel, actually, microeconomic reason. Uh, and that is that, uh, you know, better training data appears to cause greater effort in the engineers. Um, so specifically, uh, the, the engineers who got better data ended up spending 31% more hours on the task. Um, and as we, we talk about, um, you know, uh, later in the, in the talk uh, with reference to a model, you can think of better data and effort as being um, as compliments. You know, it's more worthwhile to spend an extra hour, uh, you know, developing your algorithm if you have uh, a high quality data set and that gives you some assurances that, that you'll actually get something out of it. Um, we also have a sub-treatment in our experiment, uh, randomly manipulating incentives for accuracy. And um, what we see there is that it's not just better uh, data and effort that are complementary, but, but, but better uh, data and, um, and incentives um, you know, uh, are, are complementary as well. Uh, so this is the first main uh, finding. It's, you know, it's about the, you know, why better training data uh, is so um, you know, powerful. Our second result is about programmer characteristics, okay? Now, in spite of what I showed you before about um, biased programmers, we find you know, little evidence that the minority or the less biased uh, programmers 
you know, end up writing more socially aware code. Um, and that's true both in terms of the accuracy of the predictions, uh, as well as the internal composition or the structure of the predictions, or you know what variables are being used in the algorithm. Um, and you know, and um, <clears throat> this is true no matter how we cut this data. We can look at differences along gender lines of the programmers, or along, along racial lines, um, or um, you know, or in, along the lines of, the, of our implicit association test. Um, uh, so. We'll talk a little bit more about why you find this, but uh, but broadly speaking, we find you know very little in the way of effects on of, of programmer characteristics. Okay. Now, one interesting exception to this uh, is that prediction errors seem to be correlated within demographic groups. Uh, and what I mean by that is that if you have two men uh, trying to predict math scores, they will have errors in the same direction. Um, and uh, the, the uh, you know women will have errors in you know in a different direction of men. Um, this is also true across other demographic groups. For example, in our data, uh, race. Uh, and the implication is, if you average, um, you know, across demographic groups, then uh, you know you get performance improvements, um, and that's coming from this uncorrelated error, uh, you know, feature of the of the experiment and of the outcomes. It's not coming from uh, any of the different demographic groups actually being better. Um, individually, it's more about the, you know, the, uh, the uncorrelated errors. Okay? Um, and then finally, we have uh, a few results about, uh, about the practical solutions for aggregate bias. Um, we find that simple reminders were almost, as, um, almost half as effective at improving overall accuracy um, as having, you know, completely unbiased data. Um, and this, this mainly comes from various reduction. Uh, it doesn't come so much from bias reduction. Um, although I think it's, uh, you know, you probably still would rather have better accuracy um, than not. And we also find that technical advice uh, made outcomes worse. And as I'll unpack later on, this appears to be uh, coming from the, um, uh, you know, the fact that lots of people uh, didn't correctly implement the technical advice um, or implemented in different ways, um, you know, so that so, so that there's a high level of variance in uh, what outcome the advice produced. Okay. So uh, our paper is related to uh, lots of different literatures. Uh, the obvious one is algorithmic discrimination, um, but um, you know, it's it's also related to inaccurate statistical discrimination, uh, you know, novel. Uh, audit methodologies, um, you know, this is, I, I think with the first to our, to our knowledge, audit like, uh, you know, evaluation of, of algorithms akin to the resume audits. Uh, and then finally, there, there are a couple of papers already, including some of my own about using algorithms to evaluate human capital or to uh, specifically for hiring, okay? All right, so why don't I pause here um, and uh, check if there are any questions and then after that, I'll go into some of the details of the experiment and how we executed it. So I haven't collected any questions, but if anybody would like to raise one. No worries. We, uh, yeah, yeah, if, if, uh, we already had, uh, already had some, so, so, um, so it sounds, uh, sounds good to just proceed, okay. <clears throat> The first thing I'm going to tell you about in the in the uh, empirical details or the execution details is what training data our programmers were given to try to forecast math ability. Uh, we gave them a data set that maybe this audience will have heard before more so than our American audience, which is the OECD's uh, PIAC data set. This is administrative data that's like the canonical data set for uh, cross country comparisons uh, of, of, of math literacy. Um, the OECD has essentially sent people out to administer a live math test uh, consisting of, you know, between 10 and 20 questions. It's an adaptive test. Um, and that way we have ground truth about, you know, who is relatively good uh, and, and bad at math. Um, the OECD also collects, um, you know, like thousands of covariates about each programmer. Um, and so you can give this to engineers and ask them to try to build a model, um, you know, you know, predicting math ability. And that, you know, that's exactly what we did in this. Okay? 
I would say the, the one drawback, uh, the main drawback of this data is that uh, you know, the, the, the OECD's data about ethnicity uh, isn't very good. And so we mainly focus on uh, gender disparities in the predictions, um, but, but that might change uh, at some point um, in the future. Uh, but otherwise the OECD has been very careful about you know, assembling a, um, you know, a highly representative data set uh, and I think is, has been more careful about representativeness uh, than any private sector company that I've ever seen. Um, you, know, who, you know, the private sector companies typically just use their, their own historical customer data as opposed to surveying in a balanced and representative way their, their group of potential customers, right? So the OECD's uh, uh, math test, it's a kind of skill test that an employer could use to, uh, to screen workers. Um, and like I said, they have about 5,000 covariates um, per person. And we invited our, or per subject in the data, uh, and we, we invited our AI engineers to essentially use this data in whatever they, uh, uh, way they want, and how they used it was, was one of our outcomes. Okay. So we have uh, a copy of this data set kind of clean for other researchers who may uh, want to use it on our, on our websites. Okay. All right, now the training data was one of our main interventions. Uh, so uh, I, I'll tell you about that intervention first. Okay. Some of our subjects were randomly assigned uh, a, com a completely representative uh, a kind of random sample of the, of the OECD PIAC data. Uh, and others were received a training sample that featured realistic sample selection bias, okay? Uh, so, so what do we mean by this sample selection bias? Uh, well, real world companies that create uh, hiring algorithms you know, often train them using their own historical workers' data. So we needed to find a simulation of that or um, uh, an analogy to that within the PIAC data. And so what we are using is that um, you know, some of our, our AI subjects get training data with the math performance data only for people who are already employed uh, uh, doing math jobs. And so this, this is kind of the equivalent of the problem that companies face when they don't have performance data uh, for anybody except for the ones that they historically uh, had hired into their company. Okay. All right, now, why are we studying math? Um, <clears throat> so it's an you know, important skill uh, for lots of different high wage uh, industries. It's also the topic of, uh, of gender stereotypes that, that could lead to algorithmic bias. Um, but also importantly, there are uh, relatively objectively correct answers uh, so that we can compare subjects, uh, algorithms to some sort of, um, you know, ground truth, um, as opposed to just having, I don't know, a, a subjective opinions about uh, the quality of performance or something like that. Okay. All right, now um, I'll get into our other experimental uh, manipulations uh, shortly, uh, but the first one is in this, um, you know, this, this training data that, that, that I mentioned earlier. Okay. Here's some about our subject population. We have 400 engineers. Our engineers have not been told that they're uh, in a study. Um, we, are, we have simply asked them to help develop a resume screening algorithm. And the data that we provide is uh, you know, pur purportedly scraped from resumes and job applications uh, with labels saying who, you know, who performed relatively well uh, and not, okay? 80% uh, of our AI subjects, this is the, the engineers, were recruited through an AI bootcamp uh, at a large research university. Uh, and they had on average about, uh, about you know, uh, a little above one year of work experience uh, prior to uh, entering our experiment, okay? Uh, about 31% had worked at a major company in a tech role uh, already. Sometimes this was full-time employment. Sometimes it was uh, an internship, although, you know, an internship only last three months and these guys had, uh, you know, uh, over a year on average. Um, and half were coming from industry uh, directly and half were coming from some sort of uh, uh, academic program, at least previously they could have had uh, prior work experience um, before that, but, um, but immediately before they were coming from um, industry. Okay. Uh, Bo? Yes. Can I ask a quick, quick question? Do you know Definitely. which academic program they were coming from? Yes, um, and so we have some controls for that. I don't think there's anything too interesting uh, going on. Most people were uh, coming from computer science. There were other people coming from statistics um, or electrical engineering or other neighboring fields. 
Of course, there were a smattering who were like social scientists that wanted to get into this, uh, but, but not that many there and were mostly, uh, uh, mostly computer scientists. Okay? And so partly for that reason, I think this is actually a good study population. Uh, these are the sorts of people uh, who would uh, graduate, or in most cases they've already graduated, but, but, but leave the AI bootcamp and then go to work for uh, places like Facebook and Google, uh, or the other major tech companies or the other major employers uh, you know, that, that, that have a, a large tech operation. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the big companies all, all recruit from this university and from this bootcamp. Um, and, um, you know, lots of our subjects are already developing uh, algorithms that, you know, may be touching uh, the software we use in daily life. Okay. I have now, another question. Um, uh -huh. so, so, uh, by, so Naman Gol would like a question. Uh, let me... Great. Uh, go ahead, Naman. Yeah, so I just had this question. You said that the engineers did not know that they were in a study, but, um, and then you just asked them to write some code. But did they know anything about like how this code is going to be used? Like, what is the purpose? Like, are, were they being evaluated for something? Like, you know, maximizing accuracy. Like, these, for example, if you ask students to write code, you know, there is some kind of implicit assumption that I'm being evaluated somehow on some metric. If you ask, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So of course it was very clear, especially if we want to interpret this economically to 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 specify what the incentives are. Um, and uh, we were told them they are being evaluated uh, on accuracy alone. Um, and that does not totally uh, mitigate any potential fairness issues. If you systematically, uh, I don't know, underestimate the ability of women, for example, um, then they're, you know, they're still essentially biased in the, in the prediction algorithm. Uh, but we told them they were being evaluated on accuracy alone for, for the reasons that we just discussed earlier in the slide about the, you know, about the efficient frontier. And, and, and they were, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, please go ahead. I was going to say, uh, you know, so, so this was one of their uh, assigned projects um, and they, um, uh, the grade on the assigned projects is used to help place them. So that, you know, that's what their, uh, their, their incentives come from. They seem to have taken it quite seriously. I mean, these are like ambitious little, uh, you know, 20 something people. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, I think, uh, you know, they, they worked pretty hard. And we told them also that this came, uh, you know, that this opportunity came through a research partner who might want to, uh, you know, make changes to their hiring based on what happens in this uh, this assignment? So they did have some incentive insofar as they care, you know, about the real world to, um, yeah, you know, to think about the actual impact, um, um, you know, beyond just their grade. Okay. And we surveyed people at the end. Uh, do you mind if we use your code, or um, uh, uh, you know, or if we uh, provide an introduction to you to a research partner to help do this? And most said, uh, no problem, no strings attached, or sure, as long as you pay me. Uh, and there was a pretty small fraction of people who said, I don't believe in resume screening algorithms. I only did this because it was an assignment and I actually hope that you, um, you know, no one ever actually uses this. Uh, that was something like, you know, one or 2% of the population. So, um, so not that many. Anyway, let me know if that answers your question or if you have any other ones. Yeah, so just one more question. So if we go back to mm -hmm. the training data, so what was the outcome that you were trying to predict in those data? Uh, that was performance on the math test administered by the OECD. So it wasn't like um, a decision on, on, on hiring, right? It was just prediction on a test score. That's right. And, um, you know, um, presumably hiring decisions incorporate a little bit of uh, beliefs about performance and, uh, uh, and, and a little bit other things. Um, and the reason we would want accurate predictions on, uh, on math performance is to, you know, put you on the efficient frontier of, of performance in anything else. Uh, does that make sense, though? But, I mean, even if, let's say, like, you, like, why would you want to be fair in, in predicting the score? I mean, I, I can understand that we want to be fair in, in hiring decisions because let's say the scores are imperfect or whatever. Uh, but uh, what, what, why are we expecting that somebody should write a program that is, you know, more fair when it comes to just predicting a score, math score? 
Um, so let's suppose your objective was to, for example, hire half men and half women. Um, you could do this, uh, you would still want to hire um, the best performing men and best performing women to fill up that, um, uh, you know, to fill out that half. Um, <clears throat> does this make sense? Um, uh, and also there are some companies that actually do have job screening tests so something like this would, uh, if, those, if those screening tests are expensive to administer, you may want to pre-filter um, so that uh, you know, only people likely to pass are going to take this. Um, and, but in any event, for, 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 for prediction of math uh, skill only, yeah, I mean, you, you may still want something that is fair, meaning accurate, and doesn't overestimate the ability or underestimate the ability of, of of, you know, of any group, particularly historically, uh, you know, excluded group from math. So, so let me know if you have any questions, but, but hopefully this aspect is clear. Um, and uh, Hannes, let me know if there are, if there are any other follow-up questions. Sound good? Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> this was the 80% of our subjects. And then we, we also directly hired some about 20% of our subjects as freelance programmers who had uh, about four years of experience. We got these programmers in order to balance out our 80%. Um, uh, you know, this group was more experienced and also, uh, you know, I had gone to fewer uh, top engineering schools. Um, and, you know, that, that's one of the main differences between them. Yeah. As a whole, our subject population is a little bit more diverse than the, than the software engineering population. Uh, at least in the US, we have a 30% uh, women versus about 18% uh, uh, in the BLS data. And here's, here's, how, we recruit, here's how we recruited. Um, this is our, uh, our you know, attempt to, uh, this is how we hired the, the freelance uh, programmers. And this is how we, uh, you know, this is the, the yeah, kind of opening page and syllabus um, and recruitment page uh, of the boot camp. Okay, so it tells you a little bit about what what you know what they're we're learning about in this context. Uh, lots of of the subjects already had experience going into this boot camp, and they were sort of using it uh, as a as a as like a finishing school. Okay? So this was an individual task. Um, Engineers were randomly assigned um, into four different conditions. Uh, and here are the conditions. We have a control group um, uh, that had biased training data. <clears throat> we also had two other uh, 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 experimental groups that got the biased training data. One of them got a non-technical reminder and the other got both a reminder and some jargon-free technical advice about sample selection bias. Uh, we essentially translated the, uh, you know, the, the uh, literature on this, or the, you know, the papers before you, um, yeah, you know, into something that would be easily uh, implementable by a uh, programmer. Okay. <clears throat> and then our final uh, experimental branch uh, gave the programmers uh, representative data. And like I said, this was used uh, mainly as a, a benchmark. Okay. Now, the last thing I'll say uh, uh, about this uh, experimental design is that um, you know, the, the, the subjects could have spoken to each other and contaminated each other. And I won't go into too much detail because it's in the paper, but we had various mechanisms to try to suppress this, uh, mainly by telling them that they all had slightly differentiated assignments, uh, which is true, uh, and that if you just copied someone else's, you might actually um, you know, end up harming your score. Uh, even if you weren't detected uh, as being cheated. Um, but I can talk more about that uh, a little bit in the end, okay? Here's our non-technical reminder. It basically says, uh, don't forget about the fact that this data uh, is, has sample selection bias. It comes from a biased social system um, and that, you know, that could have uh, negative impacts for your score, for other things. Um, and then we also had this uh, sub-treatment where we randomly changed the performance benchmarks um, that, were, that were tied to their payoffs. And as I was mentioning earlier, this is either their, their evaluations in the boot camp or for the uh, freelance programmers who actually paid them um, uh, in dollars. Okay? So um, <clears throat> I've already talked to you a little bit about, um, about our focus on accuracy. Um, as I go into the results, I'm gonna talk about 
uh, two main um, uh, performance outcomes, okay? Uh, the first is discrimination. Um, this is the direct use of, of gender variables to change assessments. Um, and this is, you know, we'll, we'll assess this with these resume audit type of manipulations. And the second is prediction bias. Um, and the prediction bias outcomes are, uh, are agnostic to exactly what variables were used in, in the subject's algorithms um, and how. It only looks about at whether or not certain groups are being over or underestimated in kind of systematic ways, okay? So it's, you know, it's, it doesn't care exactly what uh, uh, variables went in. If there's, if there's bias in the outcomes, then they would be flagged uh, here, okay? Okay, so um, I have about 10 or 15 minutes left. I'll, I'll, I'll get to these results quickly, but I think, I think you've already- I have, Bo, I have a question. Um, okay, great. Uh-huh. Sorry. Go ahead. Actually, Go ahead. I I haven't, it, it's a question by Maya Balakrishna, and I haven't read it, so I'm just going to read it out. I hope it's uh, so. Um, Great, if an no algorithm to predict math scores systematically underestimates the ability of one subgroup, then couldn't it still be fairly used in hiring by just using a lower threshold for that one subgroup versus another subgroup? And then even though the algorithm is unfair, it can still be used to make fair decisions? So why is prediction bias in the initial prediction algorithm a problem if it can be corrected ex post? Um, well, two things. Uh, first, in a practical sense, the, um, uh, I think using different thresholds would be illegal, at least under US law. Um, now, maybe it shouldn't be because that would allow people to do the sort of um, uh, you know, corrections that you're talking about. The other thing is that it, it may not be uh, uh, easy to discover what are the optimal two, uh, you know, two separate thresholds necessary uh, you know, to, to recover a, a correct ranking. Um, and um, uh, you know, I can get into that uh, more maybe at, at, at the end of the talk. But this, this, this is a way that uh, you know, theoretically, if you could find those, um, you know, that, that this could possibly uh, work. All right, um, <clears throat> so here's how our, here's what we found from the experiment. Uh, here's a, a quick glance at how the programmers uh, approach this problem. Uh, about 98% of them used uh, Python, but, uh, but, but the, the AI and machine learning approaches were much more varied. The most popular one was random forests, uh, but we, you know, we have uh, several people using uh, neural nets or linear models. Uh, and then uh, you know, one of the most popular approaches was to just use an ensemble. In other words, train a variety of different models using the ones on the screen uh, and, then, and then average them prior to uh, your submission. Um, I'll now show you a, a, a group of coefficient plots. And um, this coefficient plots are going to be taken from a regression that looks like this. Um, we have essentially dummies for whether the engineer got representative data or a reminder um, and technical advice. Okay, um, the results have been have standard errors clustered by by programmers, and also remember that the baseline here is is unrepresentative data uh, with no reminder or advice, which is what you know a company might do if they are completely naive to the sort of issues that we've, we've brought up. Um, and, uh, and then finally, the tech advice condition also receives the reminder. It's kind of hard to give people the technical advice without motivating why uh, it was done. Uh, so we should interpret the tech advice uh, coefficient as being additive on top of, uh, on top of the reminder, okay? So uh, our first results are about mean squared error. And maybe unsurprisingly, uh, representative data uh, has the lowest mean squared error. Uh, the reminder does about half as well as, uh, as, the, as the representative data. And as you can see, the technical advice actually makes things worse. And we'll dig into the why this happens uh, in the next couple of slides. Um, uh, but first, I told you earlier that part of the benefit of representative data just came from the, 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 its complementary nature uh, with effort. Uh, so we also have measures of how hard these subjects worked. 
Uh, we can look at their self-reported hours, but we can also look at uh, other measures of their code and how long it took them. What we find is that over a two-week period, the, uh, the represented data workers um, you know, worked about five extra hours. That corresponds to about 31%. Uh, and if we adjust our um, mean squared errors uh, on a per hour basis, um, a, uh, you know, a, about a third of the benefit of, um, of representative data actually comes from, um, you know, it comes from just, you know, encouraging the, the programmer uh, to work harder. Okay? <clears throat> now, I'll briefly mention, um, you, you know, as I alluded to earlier, uh, you know, if you think about this in the context of a model, uh, what's going on here is that the marginal benefit of effort, I think, is higher if you have good, uh, you know, high quality data. Um, and if well, that's, that's true, that, okay, yes. By Sengir Tolan. Uh, Sengir, go ahead. Hi, uh, just for understanding, uh, I didn't uh, see whether people in treatment for where they receive the representative data, do they know that they have better data? That is- Yes, right, they, they do. Um, well, they don't know that they have better data because they are blind to what the people in the other conditions are, um, but they are told that their data is representative. Um, and the people in the other rooms are of course not, and the reminder and the technical advice, even in the no reminder condition, uh, it does somewhat dryly state, uh, you know, without any flourishes that, that this data has sample selection bias and it. It says that it, it comes from the company's historical uh, uh, set of hires and performances, um, but doesn't elaborate on the implications of that for bias, okay? Um, uh, so they know, and I think this is part of why it makes sense to actually provide more effort when, uh, when they know, okay? Um, <clears throat> So um, uh, data and effort seem like they should be complements, and in fact, uh, we see this. Um, you might also wonder, uh, you know, if this is really being driven by marginal benefits, then when we increase the marginal benefits experimentally by changing uh, the incentives, um, uh, then, <clears throat> you know, then we should see some sort of effect uh, there as well on, you know, hours spent and ultimately accuracy. So we do this experiment. Uh, what we find is that, of course, the, the incentives do induce higher, you know, higher effort and better performance, but disproportionately so uh, for, for our better treatment, okay? So this is kind of, um, you know, taking us back to this idea that, uh, you know, the better data uh, incentives and, and effort are all, um, you know, complementary drivers of why. Uh, why better data is, is good. Okay. Now, let me tell you about uh, gender discrimination. Um, now, we measure gender discrimination uh, by uh, asking our programmers uh, and using the code they wrote to evaluate the same exact job candidate or the subject in the data, but either coding them as a man and leaving everything else constant or coding them as a woman and leaving everything else constant, okay? And so the first, um, you know, results you'll see on the left is uh, what percentage of our programmers' predictions changed depending on that manipulation? Uh, and the answer is about 60%, okay? We also manipulated uh, the variables in the data that were most correlated with gender. And um, at least in our context for the OECD as a whole, that turned out to be your previous job was, uh, was uh, taking care of children um, or, uh, you know, is this something in the OECD data that, that's collected and would also possibly be, uh, you know, part of a job application or, uh, or part of a job interview. And there was less discrimination uh, on this, but, uh, but still about 40% changed their evaluations um, uh, based on that, okay? Now you might wonder uh, who gets the benefit of this and uh, in over 90% of the cases, the, um, you know, the, the male version of the subject um, uh, was evaluated uh, higher. So it seems like there's uh, you know, a lot of discrimination in these algorithms um, in favor of men. Uh, and that includes um, even groups, uh, you know, even programmers who are themselves women, 
uh, or who had uh, low IAT scores or who had been given interventions to try to remind them about uh, this sort of thing, okay? Now, across our, our different um, uh, uh, treatment groups, one of the interesting things is that there's a greater use of um, a, a greater use of uh, gender variables in our representative data that, that generally performs uh, uh, well overall. Um, and as we dug into these results, what we find is that the downside of representative data is that, uh, that our programmers are more likely uh, to use a kitchen sink approach to variable selection. That is, they would just let the algorithm use everything in their data set as opposed to making uh, subjective judgments um, about, about what should be in there um, and, and, and you know, what shouldn't, okay? Um, now, um, <clears throat> uh, those are our main results. I want to make sure I don't run out of time, which I think I'm already a little bit over. Um, uh, so let me skip to uh, the, the, the programmer characteristics, okay? I previously mentioned that we don't see uh, uh, very big results um, uh, from um, you know the, the the way that our male versus our female subjects uh, you know uh, coded these algorithms, uh, or the way our high versus low IAT uh, subjects coded the algorithms, uh, or or across different racial groups uh, in our in our AI engineers either. Okay, so there's one interesting um, exception to this, uh, which is that everything I just uh, told you uh, was about the overall level of performance or the accuracy uh, and the gender bias of these predictions. Okay, so what's what's what I didn't talk about was was correlated errors, um, and what we find is that the errors of our our, uh, our AI subjects are actually correlated within uh, demographic types, um, and what that means is that you can actually uh, reduce bias by by cross. Uh, cross demographic averaging, or essentially by not doubling down on the uh, prediction errors of men, but averaging them with uh, with women, female, uh, with with female programmers as well to reduce the the averaged bias uh, or the prediction from from averaging across uh, the subjects. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So um, let me uh, wrap up because I, I uh, I'm over uh, I'm over time now. <clears throat> um, uh, AI engineers, I think, are really interesting uh, research subjects uh, for sort of a personnel or organizational research that we're talking about here. Their output is very measurable and it's easy to evaluate, uh, at least in the prediction context. You can also measure their inputs, like their lines of code, or their hours, or how much education they had beforehand. And also there are natural ways to aggregate performance into teams. And none of these things are true for lots of other sorts of white collar uh, jobs. Okay? Um, AI engineers also work on, you know, important problems with, with business and social impact. Uh, they promote news articles, they make loan decisions, um, you know, they, um, you know, decide what online ads we see, uh, and we can manipulate their, in their incentives um, and their inputs through field experiments in order to draw um, a causal inference, okay? Uh, so, uh, our paper today was, was uh, you know, uh, about the empirical aspects of AI development and uh, how this affects the development of biased uh, algorithms. Um, this is something we think is missing from, from the literature and that we try to fill um, with our experiment of uh, uh, 400 AI engineers. Um, and the motivating question was about biased programmers or biased data. These are both, I think, important issues of representation. But at least what we find is that you know the bias data has a much bigger impact for the um, uh, for the outcomes we measure, um, and this partly comes from the complementaries that we we observe between uh, between data um, effort and incentives. Okay, so uh, I apologize uh, for, for going over, uh, but I'd uh, be happy to answer questions now uh, in the remaining time. Thanks a lot, Bo. Um, I think you were well on time because uh, we had some longer questions in the in the during the talk. So that, that's fantastic. Okay, cool. no worries. <laughs> um, so there's uh, so Brandon Cunningham, Cunningham has another question, and I'll let him ask it himself. Um, okay. Go ahead, Brandon. 
Hi, Bo. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I think this is really important work that will only grow in importance over time. Um, I was curious if you thought about sort of other measures of tr well, truth that the algorithm should be picking up. Um, you know, testing has come under question with respect to whether it itself is biased. Um, and you see universities moving away from test-based admission, admissions and that sort of thing. And because if it is the fact that testing is biased, then the, algor the engineers are actually gonna be trying to build that bias into the algorithms. So did you use, did you think about any other measures of truth? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm curious if you have any suggestions. This sort of issue is why we, we wanted to do this with math. Um, you know, recent Twitter debates aside, um, I don't know if you saw this, this, uh, this giant war over two plus two equals five. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, math is relatively objective. And, um, and uh, uh, I think a lot of the concerns about the biasness of, say, the SAT is about like the vocabulary sections and the, um, you know, things that are relatively uh, more subjective than the measurement of writing quality that goes into some of these. Um, and th this is different, I think, in a fundamental way than math, um, which even if you, you allow for some subjectivity in math and whether two equals something else in different languages and everything else that um, was discussed in that thread, you know, it is, you know, has more, uh, you know, Right or, uh, right or wrong answers. Um, so, so I'm curious what your suggestions are. I guess another thing is, um, you know, I, uh, insofar as math ability is not distributed equally thanks to unequal access to education, um, that's something that uh, obviously the world should try to do more uh, to, to change. Um, but I think the typical role of a company would be to assess math ability at the, you know, adult stage at which they're potentially going to be hired. Um, and that's why they may want an accurate portrayal of this, um, you know, um, at the moment of and, and not necessarily try to attribute this to, to differences that happened earlier in life. Yeah, thank you. I, I don't have an answer to it. It's, it's very, very hard. Um, if there were a way to um, subset the testing results away from sort of word-based problems because I th my understanding is that there's also challenges with the way test writers write tests and the vocabulary they use and um, in terms of word-based testing. So I, I don't, I'm not that familiar with the testing literature, but that's the only thing that occurred to me. That's a good point. I mean, um, you know, in the OECD's test, there are some instances where, um, uh, you know, where there's a, you know, it's a word problem. Um, and so th this may, you know, this may affect the results there. Great. So we have another question um, by Daniel. Right. I will unmute him. So go ahead, Daniel. Hi there. Can you hear me? Hey, how's it going? Yes, yes. Thank you for the talk. Okay. okay. Um, of course. My question is going back to a question that we had in the talk, and I hope I didn't miss it. So you said that the programmers were told in each treatment whether there's some bias or not uh, in the training data. Sorry. Um, yes, what do they correct. know about the performance test and the, the test set? Do they know whether this is biased or unbiased? Yeah, so uh, they were told that, uh, you know, that they were looking at a company um, that, that company's data um, and that the performance labels were, uh, were, were basically measures of math skill, which have relatively objective outcomes. Um, and that, uh, and that, that, that we thought they could trust it, uh, because it was objective in the ways that I was just describing, uh, with Brendan. Okay. Um, and so we encourage, you know, we didn't want to reveal too much about the data, but we encourage them to think of this as like a, a, a basic math uh, type of job. Uh, we didn't say accounting, but this would be an example of something that, that involves, uh, you know, a, a regular amount of math on the job, but, um, um, you know, but, but doesn't, um, uh, you know, is, is not extremely high end. We surveyed them at the end 
uh, to ask the question, do you believe that the performance scores uh, accurately reflected underlying skill, uh, which was our argument that, you know, these are basically math performance. <clears throat> That's the nature of this job. Uh, or do you think that, um, you know, do, do you think that there's something weird about the performance levels? And about 90, you know, probably nine, upwards of 95% of them said, um, no, we, we think this is reasonable. Uh, we don't think that there's probably a lot of uh, subjectivity in the way these people have scored if it truly is a, a math test in the, way that, in the way that the instructions described. Great, uh, let's, let's move on to the next question. There's, uh, we still have a couple. Right. Um, so I'm gonna ask this one for Maya Balakrishnan. Uh, so the question right. is, do you think if you had people work directly in teams so together, um, would diversity within the team improve accuracy or would that be worse than having them work separately and then averaging? Well, we didn't run that experiment, so we don't know for sure. I assume that it would be um, uh, at, at least different. And it's possible that group dynamics would push the average you know, closer to what uh, the most popular person or something like this would be. Uh, that would mean that our, um, our results about averaging wouldn't be a good representation of actual teamwork in the field. On the other hand, it may also mean that teamwork in the field should try to suppress this contamination that might happen uh, so that you're averaging across you know, independent you know, attempts to do this. Um, but, but I think you know, you, it's definitely, you, you're right to, to notice this distinction, I think. Perfect. Uh, and the next question, I will let uh, Marina Chukunova ask this herself. Um, go ahead, Marina. Great, great, great. Hey, Paul. Thank you so much. Very interesting paper. I'm, uh, I'm very curious about the effect of effort and that people work better on the good data. And I'm wondering uh -huh. if it can be triggered by purely mechanical reasons. So in a sense, can it be that the better data is just more difficult to, to fit into the good predictive model? So in a sense, with the biased data, you get like this five, five, six good predictors and you're done. And with a good data, you need to fiddle around longer. I see what you mean. Um, I, uh, th that is possible. What, what we heard is the opposite, which is that the unbiased data was, was harder to work with. Um, okay. And that is because they knew in the back of their heads uh, that, that the unbiased data uh, was was messed up in some way, and they felt like they needed to sort of convert it or reweight it or something like this. But this was a little bit of a pain to do, um, and um, and so you know that ended up essentially creating problems for them. Um, um, but in, but in any event, I, I don't think it's mechanically. I think it's the other way around. Uh, um, you know, it's just easier to take your data off the shelf and start running models with it if you don't have to do a bunch of uh, adjusting beforehand. And Fabrizio, I don't know if you feel the same way about them, you know. Okay. Know okay. Thank you. Great. So uh, no more questions from the audience. I had one question, but it's, I guess, a bit more <laughs> of a, uh, I don't know, it's about the conclusions. So, so should we then think about uh, firms trying to get more representative data sets to, uh, you know, to improve diversity? And would that be a more cost-effective way than, uh, you know, I don't know, hiring, changing hiring practices or, or other diversity programs? Have you, is that a conclusion? I mean, is it, is it a conclusion that you would draw that firms focusing more on acquiring representative data is, is a good idea? Well, I do think that focusing on requiring more representative data is a good idea. And further, um, you know, our experiment speaks to this somewhat, uh, but it's also, I think uh, wisdom or lore among computer scientists in this area that better data beats better models. Um, and you know, we sort of test that when we try to introduce the technical advice to improve the model, but then still give them bad data. It's just not the same as, um, as people running the uh, off the shelf models with, you know, with good data. Um, so it definitely is a good thing. The, the part where I, um, you know, I, I, you know, do want to draw some distinction is that um, uh, so we don't find big effects of diversifying the workforce uh, 
for this particular task. Um, now, there could be other tasks that engineers do um, where diversity would be way more important. So for example, um, <clears throat> uh, in the design of the product or the specifications uh, to begin with. So our engineers were given product specifications essentially, uh, predict math ability. But in other cases, maybe engineers would have a role in, uh, you know, in setting this. Um, and that's one case where you know, people from different backgrounds would be uh, more valuable. Um, and in addition, you, you may think that there's some inherent value to having a diverse workforce for a variety of reasons. And of course, we don't speak anything, we, we don't have anything to say about that. Um, uh, I do believe it's true, but it's just not something that, you know, that we can test in this sort of uh, experiment. And uh, yeah, we, I, I wouldn't say we want our paper to be interpreted you know, as some sort of like, don't invest or care about diversity. Um, and the correlated errors actually you know, uh, sh show, show the results. Um, you know, yeah, essentially a different mechanism for, um, uh, for diversity impacting performance. Great, thanks a lot. I guess that's a, that's a very good conclusion to end this talk with. Thanks a lot again, Bowen. This was a very, uh, very- uh, Thank you guys. Work. Yeah, I really and, appreciate it. Yeah, and so one, so so thanks a lot. So one final announcement, uh, we will okay. meet again here in exactly two weeks, November 19th, Thursday at the same time, same place. And our guest will be Aya Leiponen at Cornell University. And she'll talk about uh, discovering firm's data strategies and we'll be using a topic modeling approach. All right, so have a nice evening and day, uh, all of you. Awesome. Bye-bye.